In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. A little reorientation to start for today. We have now just heard the second of three parables from Matthew's Gospel that tell the story of this encounter between Jesus and the temple authorities. He has entered Jerusalem, and like in real estate, location in these stories is often everything. Location, location, location. Simply knowing that this was in Jerusalem, we know that the stakes are higher. We know that this is the place in the end that Jesus has his life ended, and that the authorities of the day will seem to have finally put an end to that rabble-rousing revolutionary. So there is already tension building. These three parables are the three gospel lessons we hear last week, this week, and next. You'll remember that last week the context was set for us when the chief priests and elders of the people said to Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus proceeds to answer their question with a question in good rabbinic tradition. And when they cannot answer his question, he passes on answering theirs. Last week, we heard the parable of two sons, one who refuses to do as his father instructs, but later changes his mind and obeys, the other of whom agrees to do as he is told, but fails. Today, we hear about a vineyard, and next week, our story will center us at a wedding feast where the invited guests do not attend, so some folks that are walking by are dragged in off the streets. You'll have to come next week to hear the end of that one. See if you can try to not hold your breath all week. <laughs> Today's parable is often called the parable of the wicked tenants, and I think that that name is quite an understatement. The arrangement that had been made for this particular vineyard was a fairly, fairly typical one for the day. The owner of the land see, leases the land to some tenants who would care for it, tend to the crop in it, and when the harvest comes, those same tenants would give that same produce back to the owner. It seems that these tenants had another idea in mind, and rather than the harvest being returned to the owner's slaves who came to collect it, they kill those slaves. The owner sends more slaves, naturally, who receive the same treatment. And then the parable reaches the point of the absurd, as they can do, for both the landowner and the tenants. The owner thinks for some reason that he can break the pattern of their past behavior and sends his son. The tenants think to themselves, you know, if we kill that guy, we can take his inheritance. Surely, they seem to be saying, surely no one can stop us and no one will call us out on this behavior. We'll just keep going, doing what it is that we do until we get what is ours without regard for anything other than ourselves. We'll even kill the landowner's son. It's absurd, right? It's often quite tempting, and many of us have been taught to try to find the one-to-one -one comparisons or metaphors when we hear parables. The sheep are us, and the shepherd is Jesus. The lost coin is us, and the woman searching and seeking after it and rejoicing when she does, well, that is God, of course. Sometimes there's a clean way that that works, and sometimes not. But the true point of parables isn't to find the one answer, but rather to let us hold the story in front of us like a multifaceted jewel to turn and turn and turn again, to let the light shine through it, to see all of the ways we might engage with, dive deeper into and learn from, to be drawn into the story of Jesus. So perhaps something else in this parable stands out for you today, but I'm the one standing up here with the microphone, so. <laughs> Despite that, the temptation in this particular parable is to say that God is the landowner. If such a claim is made, then an assumption could be made here that God will never call us to account for the ways we misstep and hurt and harm others. And we, like those tenants, may even start to think that we could get away with it too. There are no consequences to my actions. I keep getting what I want, so keep going. In what world? In what world, I find myself asking these tenants, do you really think you would get the inheritance after killing the owner's son? 
You have killed four or five or six or more of his slaves. You think you are getting away with it free and clear, so surely the next thing to do is to go not just for the income off of one harvest, but the full inheritance. I wonder what this might say about the human ego, about the human drive toward more for ourselves, about the human need to regard ourselves alone and above others, all of which we find ourselves resisting on some days, giving into on other days, and striving to resolve and live in the midst of each and every day. Here's the thing, though. If God is indeed the landowner, there is an even greater promise. We have the kind of God, we serve and seek the kind of God who is, who is yet always, who is yet still and always trying to make a way for us to be received. Even when we think the way of the wicked tenants to go, even when we follow the devices and the desires of our own hearts, even despite of and knowing those things we have done and left undone. This promise is taken beyond this parable into the life of Jesus when we remember that God's own son is the rejected stone that has become the cornerstone for the foundation of the world. There is no doubt in my mind that that is true. There is no doubt at all in me that that truth can be shaken, but let it not be a truth that gives us permission to do whatever we would like. Well, if God will seek even those wicked tenants, we might find ourselves tempted to begin thinking, surely I can do whatever I want to, as long as I'm not as bad as them. Not so. As a gospel writer, Matthew wants to emphasize over and over throughout his gospel that for people who follow Jesus, for those who wish to be part of the kingdom of God, something is indeed expected. For Matthew, this particular something is about the fruits that we bear. We all must ask ourselves as members of the body of Christ, are we producing fruits for this kingdom of God or not? Are there ways we think we can act? What might cause us to think we can act in such ways that are not of this kingdom and yet still make a claim on those promises as if we deserve it? It's a tough question. But when we hear Jesus say today, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces fruits of the kingdom, we see that the stakes are high. Jesus really is asking something, something substantive and real of his followers, to be ones who bear good fruits, fruits of God for the world. It's worth a quick aside here to say that that verse that I just quoted has been often misinterpreted quite poorly uh, to favor Christians over Jews, to say that God prefers Christians over Jews, taken away from a people and given to another people. I only mention that here because some of us might have been taught it depending on where we were raised. And it's worth saying that that is unequivocally wrong, not just uh, by accuracy, but by ethic. One of the very first pieces of scripture I memorized comes from the 15th chapter of John's Gospel. You do not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. It was about 15 years ago, maybe more now, when I was set to head to probably the most significant interview of the discernment process for ordination. The tension in this story kind of gets shot out because I'm, you already know the end of it, but I, I was set to head to the most significant interview of the discernment process, and I was in my early 20s. At the advice of some friends and mentors, had convened a practice interview that went by literally every measure out there terribly. I was nervous and guessing on the right answers if such a right answer were possible, and struggled immensely. And it was obvious to everyone. So on the morning I woke up for the real interview, I wasn't exactly reassured by practice. For some reason that morning, I checked my email, a habit I wasn't in at the time. One of my good friends and mentors, who was still such today, had sent me a long email reminding me of who I am and what had drawn me to the process in the first place. And all of those good things, you just need somebody to remind you of sometimes when you're getting ready to walk into a room like that. And it was that verse, that one about fruit that he quoted at the end. 
And it's because of that moment and that time in my life that it has stuck with me ever since. And I suppose it was that for me that I consciously and subconsciously return to over and over to know whether what I am doing is what I am called to. Just what kinds of fruits are being born from my work, just what kinds of fruits are being born from our work, from our ministry, from our life in Jesus in this place? Are they fruits that will last or fruits of our own efforts that inevitably go bad? Are they fruits that will endure or ones that are a flash in the pan? Are they fruits that will nourish the world, primarily given not for ourselves but for the world? Or are they fruits that were only ever born to nourish ourselves? These are questions ever before me and perhaps there for your reflection too. Now earlier I said Jesus is asking something, something substantive and real of his followers today to not just be people who passively receive that we have a God who relentlessly seeks us, always trying to make a way, but rather to embrace that truth and to live differently because of it. So what fruits might we bear that reveal this promise to the world? What fruits might we bear that endure for the life of the world? If we are willing to go there, we will also need to be willing to tell ourselves some potentially tough truths. Just as the vineyard in Isaiah had vines bearing not grapes, but wild grapes, so too may we need, dare I say, will we need, to do the work of removing that which grows within and around us that may pull us into growing in a way that we would rather not, that God would call us away from. But let us be a people who do that work. And let us do that work knowing that our God yet still seeks to make a way to us and for us to wake, make a way back to God. Let us do that work that our lives might more fully day by day and moment by moment be given over to the work of God all around us. That our lives might more fully be rooted in God's own love and mercy and joy for the world. So that in all we do and are, we might bear those same fruits for the life of the world.